TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Welcome to the Waco History Podcast. I'm Randy Lane, great-grandson of Waco architect Roy E. Lane. Over 100 years ago, he designed the Alico Building, Hippodrome, and other well-known landmarks. My co-host, Dr. Stephen Sloan of Baylor's Institute for Oral History, is helping me learn Waco's known and unknown stories. On this episode, Invisible Icon, the Tom Wilson story. If you look at the Wikipedia page for Tom Wilson, the very first page of there is a picture of him and Bob Dylan. The Waco native music producer is behind some of the best-known artists of the 1960s. Keep Waco Loud, another Waco-centric podcast, is putting together a series exploring his legacy. We talk with one of the producers of the podcast, Zach Burke, about the upcoming project. Tom Wilson is the reason we have Simon and Garfunkel. Subscribe to their podcast feed and get the first episode on July 7th. And now, join us on a trip into Waco's past. Cross the Brazos and Waco Tom Wilson was a music producer during the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. And the artists that are on his list of who we got to work with were kind of a who's who of the time. In a sense, the big three being Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, and the Velvet Underground. But then there's also people like Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, the Animals, a lot of great jazz artists, you know, Sun Ra, Cecil Taylor. Uh, He did a session or two with John Coltrane. So just amazing artists that he interacted with and helped create great music with. After his death, it seemed like he didn't get the same amount of credit that a lot of people did. Everybody knows who Phil Spector is. You know, everybody knows these great producers. And while maybe Tom didn't have an iconic sound like a Phil Spector with that whole wall of sound type, he influenced the music and different genres a lot, especially during the 60s, in my opinion. Even hinting at one point in time for throw a little nice nugget out there of he feels like he helped Dylan kind of go more electric there with the switch in the mid sixties. So, which is a big thing for Bob Dylan's career. So the short answer, the whole too long, didn't read Reddit posts. He's a great producer who worked with Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, the velvet underground, and just influenced music greatly. Part of the reason why he's not recognized as much, Zach, is he dies at a fairly young age, right? He dies at the age of 47 in 1978. His father also died early, too. But that mixed with, you know, other things that maybe towards the end of his career, he didn't resonate with that music at the time with the rise of, you know, punk and stuff as he did and was able to get stuff of the 60s. It's something that we're looking to explore you know, a lot more in depth because that's the big answer of why then did some guy go from working with everybody in the sixties to kind of fizzling out there in the seventies, but it's very intriguing, but yeah, uh, super young. He's actually buried over in uh, the Doris Miller Memorial Cemetery with his parents. And that's great that you mentioned that because one thing that you did in researching him is you wanted to kind of establish his Waco credentials. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Tom Wilson as a Wacoan? So I listened to the last episode you guys did about Jules Bledsoe, which is another guy that when I went through my list, obviously I came across Jules Bledsoe. And if it weren't for me discovering Tom Wilson, I probably would have gone down that route of a guy who is just horribly underrated or just unknown in a sense for what he was able to do. Funny enough, there are tons of interweavings between Jules Bledsoe and Tom Wilson and the Wilson family, the main one being New Hope Baptist Church. 
Tom's grandfather was a man by the name of B.T. Wilson is what he went by, or Bertress. And they moved from Illinois here to Seguin before then moving up to Waco. They moved to Waco because B.T. was a college professor and he worked at Central Texas College in the early 1900s, which again, this this whole family has just so much of first and just great kind of events that they're able to accomplish as African-Americans in the time, the whole family. And it's just truly remarkable. But he worked as a professor at Central Texas College and he owned a rug laundry down on on North 8th Street because he believed that what Booker T. Washington said that minorities needed to own their own businesses. And he also wanted it and helped to send his sons to college as well. So they had a rug laundry and he was a professor. He was also on the building committee for New Hope Baptist Church. They had five sons, one of those being Tom's father, which is Tom Wilson Sr. Tom Wilson Sr. ended up being one of the choir directors at New Hope Baptist Church. He actually led a choir at the Texas, the Centennial in 1936 and was there. And so again, New Hope is is a huge thing. Tom, apparently, I think from what I read was a part of the choir while he was there too. His grandfather worked after that at, as the principal at Moore High School, which then his uncle took over, Joseph Wilson. I think he went by JJ and was the principal at Moore High School for 37 years. There's just so many different ties to Waco history and the Wilson family that it's just so great to me, this story of Tom is here for 18 years and then goes off to college like a lot of people. But in that 18 years, he was a part of a family that has their fingerprints all over the city. Yeah, very much a Waco one. Funny enough, the for me, some of the more interesting history, because I just love deep diving into things like this and thinking of you know, how they were back then. Tom grew up on 415 Ivy Avenue, which is close over there by campus, is where their family home was. His father worked for, so Tom Sr. worked for Atlanta Life Insurance, and their office building was over on 111 Bridge Street, which was a hub for a lot of the minority-owned businesses there at the time. But then, unfortunately, when the tornado came through in 53, it did a lot of damage there to Bridge Street. But it's things like that that I think just adds so much more to the story is not only the great things that Tom was able to do in the music industry, but also how his family connects to Waco as a whole. I mean, I, I, I love the fact that also, you know, Tom's grandpa, this rug laundry that they had eventually was passed on through the family after their grandfather died, but the family loved music so much. And they would have like these local jam sessions that they would have at the rug laundry, which is kind of how, you know, Tom, developed a love for music in a way too as being around these as well so just so much that's intertwined with Waco that I think just adds to the story and so I know you're going to go into his history about how he becomes a record producer but can you kind of talk to me about how he goes from from Waco and being an African-American to reaching that level of success far away from here originally he left and went to Fisk University which is in Tennessee. And I'm trying to think Nashville is okay. It's in Nashville. And he was there. And while he was there at Fisk university, he was invited to Harvard university that at the time, but there was a guy by the name of Chuck Israels, who's a bass player actually, who met Tom while he was there in Harvard and just talked about Tom kind of stuck out a little bit just because there weren't a lot of African-American men there at Harvard in the early 1950s but that he was just as smart as anybody else. And he showed up and it kind of blew Chuck away because, you know, finding out that he was from this small Texas town, everybody automatically thinks probably, you know, well, what's he doing here in Harvard? Oh, this must be one of those things where they're going to accept so many, you know, black students now. But Chuck said that he was as bright or as smart as anybody there, that it was one of those things of like Tom was, just a smart, talented individual, even from the beginning there, before getting into the music industry. The love for music, I think, goes back to New Hope with his father being the choir director. And obviously, apparently, the family listened to a lot of 
classical and gospel music. And then somewhere along the way, love of jazz came into the Wilson family. And Tom was a huge fan of jazz and then was able to work at the Harvard College radio station. And he would then turn around and kind of do what he got to experience as a kid and have jam sessions there at the college, the college radio station with different jazz musicians. So it's from there then that I think he gets the idea kind of branching out and working in music more. But the roots are set there. It's from everything there at New Hope with his family. He was also part of the Jazz Society there at Harvard too. And being able to DJ campus station there that I think it just kind of grew in him more to think that, all right, this is what I'm going to do kind of thing. Did he actually play an instrument or did he just appreciate it? He played trombone. That's the one thing that I know. Yeah, I think he learned that when he was super young. I say super young, like 12 years old or so. But as far as I can find, funny enough, trombone is the one instrument that everybody talks about that he learned how to play. (laughs) But then you have to think, you know, there's so many music people out there that, oh, I learned how to play this. But then over time, they teach themselves how to play everything else. So maybe it turned into something else. Or maybe it was just what I think more is he just enjoyed the music. He enjoyed being around those people who played great music and he appreciated that he was an ambassador for good music and he knew it when he saw it or when he yes heard. that that is a that is a great way to phrase it so when he gets started yes it's about bringing this jazz these jazz artists that he's working with at harvard it's about mm-hmm. pressing some lps with that group yes okay. he there's an attempt to start his own record label and obviously we'll dive into that more on invisible icon but it doesn't go the way he wants it to. And so that's how then he winds up at Columbia. But in that time, he does work with those jazz musicians that he looked up to. Sun Ra is a big one. I brought up Cecil Taylor earlier. Also, John Coltrane. He's working all those while he's trying to make a record label work. And there's some great stories with that too. But then it just doesn't wind up like he wants to. And so now he has to go and work for somebody else. The goal is to, if you have your own record label, you run everything. So you don't have to answer to anybody. And then unfortunately, if it doesn't work out, he has to go answer to people. But little did he know it would, it would open up a lot more for his music career by doing so. So I don't want to give too much away. We've talked about this before, and I I really want to push people to listen to your podcast. So can you tell me about the way you're kind of sectioning off this podcast and and who you're expecting to have as far as like interviews and stuff on that? So obviously we want to focus on all of the local ties to start off and just kind of set those Waco roots that we've talked about, because I think that's a strong part of the story too. Then we'll talk about the college years more in depth. You know, he wound up at Harvard, the people he meets there, then starting his own record label and how that goes before getting the job with it was actually with uh, United Artist Records that leads to working for Columbia. And once he gets to Columbia is when things go into high gear because that's working with Bob Dylan. That's being a part of the albums, the times they are changing. That's being a part of bringing it all back home and even working on Like a Rolling Stone. And there's a great, great story that will be on the podcast about that. How influential in a way he was for Like a Rolling Stone, which is considered, at least by Rolling Stone, to be the greatest song of all time. I don't know if it's just because it says Rolling Stone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good criteria. But then, you know, from there, he winds up at Verve and MGM. That's where he works with the animals. That's where he works with Frank Zappa. There's so much to this story. I skipped actually while he was still working at Columbia is where he works with Simon and Garfunkel. And which is a great story. Save that for the, about their, their debut album. Yeah. Yes. No, that that's so fantastic. I think that we could do a whole episode on that story itself. So we might end up breaking the Columbia stuff into two episodes because there's just so many moving parts, but the teaser that I can throw out there, I think is Tom Wilson is the reason we have Simon and Garfunkel. And we'll just leave it at that. So moving on then from there, working at Verve and MGM, he had his own radio show, other artists he worked with. There's just so much stuff that we have, and it's just so much great content and a great story. And we are looking forward to telling it so much so we can hopefully be able to you know, tell this man's story to people 
who either know a little about it, don't know anything about it at all, or maybe, you know, there's somebody lucky enough to know the whole story, but still might not know the more intricate things. I mean, I've gone down a bunch of different roads, making phone calls, sending out emails, recording on, you know, with my little handheld Zoom microphone in the car to somebody who will finally talk to me to try to get notes on stuff. It's fun playing that investigative reporter, but in this case, I feel like it's worth it. It's something that's been super close to me, really been something that I've wanted to achieve for the past two, three years. It's a man that I feel is just, again, criminally unknown. And especially if I can get him recognized in the city, that's great. That's that that would be fantastic. And it's something I'd love. And it's a man that I think, though, that might need to be recognized even on a more national level, too. So do you have any really good interviews you got from like people that everyone would know? We have some fantastic stuff that we're looking to. People like Mo Tucker with Velvet Underground is going to be huge. I mean, that's reason alone to kind of listen to that Velvet Underground episode that we're going to do of Invisible Icon. But also even people I'm working on getting Al Cooper, who was in the studio the day that they recorded Like a Rolling Stone for him to tell the story of that, which he's a part of. I brought up Chuck Israels, who again is, you know, still a, a really good bass player, but he worked with Tom at that record label. So I have stories about, you know, them with that. There's things we're working on. There's people we're reaching out to. And by the time we have this out and out there, uh, there'll probably be more people than I've even mentioned now. And it's going to be just an amazing journey to listen to. All right. And I plan on trying to time this release of this podcast to right before you guys launch your podcast. So to make sure everyone's, you know, subscribed up and and ready to go when your podcasts drop, where exactly can they find it and how can they subscribe? We're going to have it on all the same venues that you can get the Keep Wake Aloud podcast. So we'll have it there, obviously, on the website through where you listen to podcasts the Apple podcasts. There's so many of them now, right. but I can guarantee you if you can listen to a keep like a loud podcast there, you're going to be able to find this. It's just going to be, it'll be the invisible icon who is Tom Wilson that you'll be looking at as an episode instead of keep like a loud icon. And we're expected to drop this, you know, episode one to get these things going. And we want to be able to release it a new episode each week for about nine, 10 weeks until we get it out there. So that's a that's lot of episodes. Plan. It, there's a lot of stuff, you know, we uh, want to make sure also that with telling this, this story that we don't give too much. So we're, you know, we're aiming for 30 to 45 minutes, just a nice little palatable listening to on your drive to work and back. And it's enough for you to be able to take in and then you get done and you think to yourself, I'm ready for the next episode. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the goal. So I'm stoked about this and I'm looking forward to it so much. So just make sure that you're subscribed to the Keep Waco Loud podcast and then follow their presence on social media and their website to make sure you don't miss it, right? Yes. And I will go through, if you would like to follow me on Twitter at Zachary Burke, I will go through and be plugging everything as well. It's something that, again, if you follow Keep Waco Loud, if you follow me, if you follow Rogue Media Network, you're going to find this. And we're going to do our best to make sure that we get it to those people who don't follow us either. And getting it out there for everybody to be able to consume and enjoy the story. You know, we've talked a lot about different Wacoans that have left a legacy on Waco long past when they've been alive. What do you think is the legacy that Tom Wilson leaves in Waco? What, what do you think he would say to future generations? I think that... In my opinion, he's a man who knew how to get the best out of people, who was able to sit there and put out the best product without having an ego to do so. I guess the biggest thing to take away or the legacy there is it's about the art in a sense. It's about whatever that passion is of getting out and being able to do the best you can and not letting everything else kind of weigh you down, but finding a way to do the best you can and get out the best creative product that you can. That's great. So sometimes it's not about being the front man that everyone knows, but it's the guy, no. the collaborator who brings all the great people together. Exactly. I think that that can be said for a lot of people throughout history. If certain people aren't involved, there's so many people that are behind the scenes of stories 
that end up leading to these great big things. If you're able to get out the best product possible, then it's okay to be behind the scenes a bit. Tom, to me, was a person who was a more us, 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 or just, hey, I'm going to help lift you guys up kind of thing. And I think that that's what's great about this as well, is he helped take these artists to another level. And I think that that should be part of his legacy is what he was able to do, you know, whether it be a more electric sound with Dylan, whether it be what happened with Simon and Garfunkel, or there's a crazy story that we'll get to on the podcast too. You know, even guys that he came across that he could have signed and brought in, but for some other reason or another, wasn't able to work. And then that guy went on to do great things on his own without it. There's just so many, I I just think his legacy is he helped get people to where they needed to be with that having to be at the forefront of it. Zach, I think it's wonderful that you're doing this. I can hear it in your voice. It's a passion project for you to get the story out. It sounds like y'all are doing it the right way. I appreciate it. And hopefully so. I'm so happy to finally be able to get to a point where we can get this out and, you know, help finally be able to present this invisible icon out to the public. And part of the reason why I love that name for this podcast is because I feel like it is so fitting. It's a man who it's invisible in the sense of not like he didn't do anything, but in a sense of where he's not as known as maybe he should be for the iconic things that he was able to do. So I think the invisible icon fits Tom Wilson and I'm so just excited for this podcast journey that we're going to be able to take people on. You know, and Garfun- Garfunkel's got to be sheltering in place, so he ought to be available. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah get Garfunkel <laughs> hey, for this thing. Yeah, I, I will, because yeah. I feel like, no disrespect to Art, but he might be a little bit easier to get than Mr. Paul Simon. So, uh, Well, thanks so much for coming on and, and telling your story and telling Tom's story, or at least part of it, you know, kind of whetting our appetite for your podcast series, and we look forward to listening to it. Hey guys, I appreciate the time very much. Go ahead and subscribe. Make sure you look out for Invisible Icon, who is Tom Wilson. I can tell you that, at least in my opinion, it's a story that we're all passionate about that we want to get out there. And I don't think you'll be disappointed at all in this story. Uh, Thanks again for having me on. Thanks, man. Again, we'll put this in the show notes, but subscribe to Invisible Icon, the Tom Wilson story, wherever you get your podcasts. First episode drops on July 7th. Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. We'll see you next time. time ago, as he dropped the guns that she hated in the muddy Brazos below. Cross the Brazos at Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. In Waco, I'll walk straight in old San Antonio. Then the night came alive with gunfire. He knew that at last it'd been found. As the ranger's badge showed brightly, El Bandito lay on the ground. Carmella knew he was dying, that all of her dreams were in vain. As she kissed his lips for the last time, she heard him whisper again. Cross the Brazos and Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco. I'm safe when I reach San Antonio. I'm safe when I reach San Antonio.